Veni Creator Spiritus, mentes tuorum visita, implesum. Welcome. Uh, my name is Bob Schutz. I'm the founder of the John Paul II Healing Center in Tallahassee, Florida. And uh, for years I was a marriage and family therapist and taught courses on marriage and family. And now we have a, a ministry called uh, John Paul II Healing Center, where we offer conferences, healing conferences, including for marriages. And what does it mean to protect the heart of your spouse? Another way of saying that would be to guard the heart of your spouse. And the scripture says uh, that we need to guard our own hearts because they're the wellspring of life. But in marriage, the two become one. And so to guard our own heart is to guard the heart of our spouse. And to guard the heart of our spouse is to care for our own heart. Uh, because in marriage we give our hearts to one another and we are, be we are called to become the caretaker, the, the guardian of each other's hearts. That's really a lot of what marriage is. And so I want to talk about the different ways that we can do this, recognizing that it first begins with learning how to guard our own hearts. And what are we guarding from? Uh, we're guarding from all kind of dangers that the enemy of our souls is trying to inflict against us and against our marriage. Uh, marriage is an image of God. It's uh, the image, as the book of Ephesians says, the image of Christ's love for the church. And just as Christ gives himself to us as the church and fights for our hearts, we're called to do that with one another so that we can become the image of God. But the enemy hates marriage, uh, the father of lies, the one who Jesus calls the father of lies. He hates marriage. He hates anything that represents love and the image of God. And so constantly he's attacking us and he's attacking our marriages and the places of our hearts. Because what are our hearts but the capacity to love? I'm, I'm speaking now about our spiritual hearts. Uh, all the way through the scriptures we have this language about the heart and that we're supposed to love God with our whole hearts and to love one another uh, from the heart. And to do that, we need to be good stewards of our heart. Our hearts, as the scripture says, are like uh, soil, uh, fertile ground that depends on what we put in our hearts uh, will cause it to grow. And it's either going to grow in love or it's going to grow in the antithesis of love, things that destroy love. And so think for a moment about how you guard your own heart. Uh, how do you do that? Uh, I think first and foremost by what you put into your heart. What do you put into your mind and what do you put into your heart? Uh, what, do you, what do you take into your life? Uh, if you, for example, are uh, looking at pornography, you're polluting your heart. You're uh, allowing your heart to become disordered. Or if you allow anger to build up in your heart, you're polluting your heart. You're not guarding your heart. Uh, St. Paul says, do not let the sun go down on the anger and give the devil a foothold. Uh, when we do that in marriage, for example, and we allow bitterness and resentment to build up, uh, we become, rather than the guardian of our spouse's heart, we become the one who inflicts the pain in the other's heart. Uh, so when we, when we build up resentment, inevitably it's going to come out of our heart into our spouse and we're going to say cruel things or we're going to be belittling or we're going to show different ways in which we don't respect and honor them. And in all of those things, we then wound the heart of our spouse. Another way, a very tragic way, is we can wound the heart of our spouse by unfaithfulness. Uh, anything from little to big, uh, unfaithfulness could be uh, thinking negative thoughts about our spouse or it could be saying hurtful things to our spouse, or it could be unfaithfulness to our spouse by uh, having an adulterous relationship with somebody else. All of those ways are extremely damaging, obviously to different degrees, but they're extremely damaging to the heart of our spouse. And so rather than being the one who guards the heart of our spouse, we become the one who inflicts the damage to the heart of our spouse. And I've worked with many people over the years where uh, it's been difficult to restore trust once that damage has been done. 
You know, a covenant relationship, which is what marriage is, it's a sacrament and it's a covenant. And in a covenant relationship, like in the Old Testament, uh, people would make covenant and they would basically, and this happens even in other places of the world now, people would basically uh, bring them their coat and give them their coat, which would say, you belong to me and I belong to you. And they'd give them their weapons and say, this is my pledge to protect you and that I won't hurt you. You're going to be the one that I protect. And as marriage is a covenant, we don't use that kind of symbolism, but the meaning is still there. That in, in the marriage relationship, we're saying, I'm going to be your biggest defender, and I'm not going to do anything to hurt you. Now, obviously, all of us have been weakened by original sin and our own personal sins and our own woundedness, and so we do hurt each other. But what do we do to prevent that or to protect our spouse's heart, even after we've hurt them. It's the process of forgiveness and apology. Uh, if, if I have hurt my spouse in humility, I need to be able to go to my spouse and say, without any blame and without any criticism, you made me do this or anything like that. It's, I'm sorry. Uh, I recognize that what I said to you was unkind. Or maybe in more serious situations, I, I am so deeply sorry for betraying you the way that I betrayed you. And I know it's going to be a while to restore our trust, but I want you to know that my my desire, my heart is intent on restoring that trust and not hurting you, but, but caring for you and guarding your heart. Uh, I'm responsible for that. No matter what's happened in our relationship, I did that and I'm responsible. It's like making a good confession to God. It's acknowledging that to our spouse. And I'm, I'm promising you that I'm going to do everything in my power to heal this in our relationship. Sometimes the, the wounds come not just from each other, but prior to the relationship. And so to guard the heart of our spouse is to care for them in the places where others have wounded them, past and present. I know one of the mistakes I often made when my wife would come home and she'd have a bad day at work and talk about how somebody mistreated her, I would always get rational and, and try to investigate and see what she did to hurt them. And, and, and it was just really not helpful at all. Uh, it was like I was playing therapist rather than caring for my wife's heart. And in those situations, what she really needed for me is to just listen to her and to listen to how she was mistreated and how it hurt her and not be concerned at yet about how she responded to the situation, but just how she felt. And to want to be there to stand up for her, to, to, to be her defender. First of all, defend her in my eyes uh, and defend her in the way that I prayed for her and prayed for those situations. But also to believe in her, to affirm her and, and to bless her in those places. And whenever I failed to do that, I could tell that it was a double hurt that she felt not only hurt by the person at work, but hurt by me not being present to them. That's true also when the hurt is in the past. You know, sometimes your, your spouse will share with you things that have happened to them in the past. And they don't need you to go out and right all the wrongs. But we need each other to be compassionate, to be able to say, oh, I'm really sorry to hear uh, that. And, and not just to say the words, but to, to have compassion, to have uh, a sense of empathy for what they've gone through. Not trying to fix it, but just listening. You know, what trauma research has shown us is that when people are hurt, uh, there's a great deal of trauma that gets stored in the heart of the person. And if that trauma isn't released, then that trauma stays with them and is carried there, and it makes it difficult for them to open up and trust and love in the future. And one of the things that increases that trauma is when the person, let's say your spouse has been hurt by an angry parent or hurt by some kind of sexual abuse uh, in their past. Now you didn't cause that hurt, but you can re-hurt them by not being attentive to that hurt when it gets brought to the surface and really caring for your, your spouse in that place where their heart has been hurt. You know, the goal of marriage is love, and it's to be an image of love, to be the image of God's love. But we both bring into the marriage uh, areas of our hearts that are 
wounded in love, where, we, where we've lost trust in love. And so part of guarding the heart of your spouse, protecting the heart of your spouse, is fighting for the heart of your spouse, really looking at those places and helping our spouse walk through those areas. Uh, we have a lot of resources at the John Paul II Healing Center if you need help with that. Um, there's a book in Spanish called Se Sanada uh, that has just come out. and it's In English, it's Be Healed. And also Be Devoted is a book. Uh, we don't have it in Spanish yet, but it, in Be Devoted is about healing in marriage and how to build unity and, and caring in marriage in, in different areas. And so how do we do that? How do we build that unity? Because to build that unity is really to protect and guard the heart of your spouse. So in Be, in be Devoted, uh, I speak about these five areas where we need to establish that kind of unity and that kind of love. Uh, the first of those is spiritual unity. And we need to be both grounded in a prayer life. That, that's really the best way to protect each other's hearts is to be able to pray for one another and pray with each other. Uh, couples that pray together regularly, statistics have said, and, and I don't know if, how exact these are, but they really give you a picture, is that there's only a 1% divorce rate in couples who pray together regularly. That's the best assurance you can have to preserve a marriage. Compare that to, say, 70% of people who get married in the church. Uh, if they just get married in the church, that's a good assurance, uh, 70%. But if they go to worship regularly every week, it goes up to about 90% chance of being together for life. And if they pray together every day, it's about 99%. So the best marriage insurance you can give to yourself and your spouse is to pray with each other and pray for each other. And also pray so that you can engage in the battle. You know, one of the ways we pray is... Uh, Jesus gave us the prayer of the Our Father, and it says, deliver us from evil. And some of those evils are the things that come at us every day. And so we're praying for each other, protecting each other, praying for prayers of protection. Prayers like the St. Michael prayer or the rosary are great ways of praying for protection for your spouse and for your family. So that's the first area is spiritual unity. The second area is emotional intimacy. In a marriage where there's emotional intimacy, where you're able to be vulnerable with each other and share what's going on, uh, the happy times, the joy that you have, but also the, the difficulties that you have. When it becomes safe to share, we're going to really open up and develop an intimacy. But when we either don't listen or we don't take the time to really hear each other or we try to fix each other's problems or we criticize each other or condemn each other, then all of a sudden that trust goes away. And when the trust goes away, then it's difficult to, to have that intimacy. And without that intimacy, uh, we begin to drift. And that leaves us both very vulnerable to the work of the enemy. It leaves us vulnerable to outside attractions. It leaves us vulnerable to uh, shame and self-criticism and loneliness and isolation. And we all have moments of those in, in marriage, but Overall, if we can really attend to that emotional intimacy, uh, it'll give us marital health and it'll protect our hearts against so many things that would come against us. The third kind of uh, unity in marriage uh, I call companionship. And companionship is all of the basic ways that we spend time with each other. And sometimes they're invisible. They could be things like uh, going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time or sitting on the couch watching your favorite TV show or movie, or going for a walk together, or folding laundry together, or taking care of the kids together. It's just the things that we do together. We share in this together. And without that kind of companionship, again, we can feel very lonely. And it makes our marriage vulnerable uh, to outside influences, even uh, to things like uh, drinking or or overeating, those kind of things. When we, when we have that loneliness, we, we don't uh, have the health that we need. And this really came home to me several years ago. My wife died about four years ago. And uh, I had not, you know, I knew we had a day-to-day -day companionship, but I hadn't realized how powerful that was until she was gone. And I remember the first time I sat on the couch 
afterwards and she wasn't there, or went to bed at night and she wasn't there, or even went on the first trip to give a conference. And I usually would pick up the phone and call her, and uh, she would be the first person I'd call when I arrived. And I picked up the phone this time and recognized, oh, there's nobody on the other end. And at that moment, I realized how valuable that companionship was, just the day-to-day being in each other's presence. And that really protects our hearts against a whole lot of things that can come against us. The fourth area is teamwork. And in teamwork, uh, we're getting over the power struggle of doing it my way or doing it your way, which really becomes a damage to each other's heart. And in that, we're mutually submitting to God and we're saying, God, we want to do your will and we want to cooperate with each other. And so whether it's in finances or in what, how do you shop or how do you clean the house or how do you take care of children or how do you make decisions about your future, all that requires teamwork. And in good teamwork, we listen to each other and try to hear what's in each other's desires. We don't get into a power struggle about I'm going to do it my way or no, I'm going to do it my way. Uh, spiritual headship in the family that the Bible talks about is not the man running the family from the standpoint of being dominating or domineering. Uh, the scripture says, husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And so that's a kind of submission. And it also says, wives, submit yourself to the husband as to the Lord. Uh, that mutual submission is not fighting for my way and your way. That just hurts each other's hearts. But when we're mutually submitted to God, we're protecting our hearts. We're protecting each other's hearts. And we're, we're allowing that unity to take place, which becomes a protection for the whole family. Then finally, sexual intimacy. Sexual intimacy is reserved in God's kingdom for the marriage relationship. And so one of the ways to protect our hearts is to protect our our, high, our eyes and our affections and not to give it to anybody else. Uh, but secondly, it's to enter into that love relationship with each other, building those other four areas of intimacy because when our hearts begin to drift because we don't have spiritual unity or emotional intimacy or cooperation or teamwork, uh, companionship, when, when we begin to drift, then making love with each other becomes just our bodies and not our hearts. And that actually does great damage to our hearts, even in the same uh, situation where it looks like uh, this is lovemaking. It's really not love in the presence of that. Again, our hearts are made for love. And when our hearts don't engage in love, then we begin to feel used. We begin to feel taken advantage of. And as we enter into sexual intimacy with, with one another as spouses, uh, it needs to be in freedom. It can't be coerced. It needs to be a gift of ourselves and an openness to ourselves. It needs to be a faithfulness and a fruitfulness and openness to God and openness to life. And all of those ways protect our hearts. But every time we have failed to protect each other's hearts, we can also repair the damage, as I said before. Uh, we can help each other heal. We can forgive and ask for forgiveness. We can learn how to apologize. Again, all of that is my book, Be Devoted, and in our marriage conferences, which are called Unveiled. And uh, you can get those on our website at the John Paul II Healing Center. But whatever ways that you pursue protecting your spouse's heart, recognize it's the best investment you can give. Uh, over the course of our marriage, I did that well at times, and I didn't do that well at times. And if there's anything that I have a desire for, it'd be to be able to go back and redo some of those times and I didn't protect and guard my wife's heart or didn't protect my own heart from the temptations that came and temptations even to resent or to, to become bitter. And so I hope what you take away from this is your heart is the most valuable commodity that you have, yours and your spouse's. And if we don't guard them, it's not only the wellspring of our life, but it's the wellspring of our marriage. If we don't guard our hearts and guard our spouse's hearts, really protect each other's hearts, then we're going to do grave damage, not only to each other, but to ourselves and to our children, if we have children, and to the people around us. And we've all experienced situations where hearts have been damaged and marriage is broken down. And so as a sacrament of Christ's love for the church, make this your primary 
goal after your love for God, which is to love each other and protect each other and serve each other. The Catechism says the heart is our hidden center. It's the place of our will. It's the place of encounter with God. And it's also the place where we encounter each other in love. May God bless you.